morning and welcome to this, our public worship service at St John's Presbyterian Church Annerley with one of our retired pastors, Reverend John Roth, leading worship this morning. Again, it is acknowledged that John has been unwell uh, during these past couple of weeks, so his presence is uh, appreciated this morning. However, with your patience, uh, this service will be undertaken in the same pattern as last week. Just uh, regarding our church family, again, we commend you, Richard and Anne, uh, as, they, uh, as Richard undergoes a series of treatments and we think of Anne and her situation. Uh, it is pleasing to see Gordon with us this morning. Uh, he's been absent for some weeks, as with Wendy, undergoing various tests, and he'll begin a series of treatments tomorrow. So we do uh, trust that that will go well. We think of Wendy, who's at home today, still recovering from health issues. Please remember Karen, as she recovers from a recent successful medical procedure as well. We think of our man's family, uh, as always, and uh, Martin and Judy remain on leave for this coming week, returning as of Monday, 5th of August. There are various others uh, within our midst undergoing medium or long-term treatment, some dealing with winter illnesses as well, so we do commend all to your prayerful concern. We think of all of our church family members and retirement complexes. We think of Murray and Helen Tate uh, coping with their general limitations, uh, but uh, we do remember them in, in our prayers. We think of those with long-term illness, Jean Millard and Michael Nuckler. Following our service, we have our time of fellowship in the hall with morning tea, so we are encouraged to join for that time together. This morning also, the morning prayer meeting will be held in the vestry, commencing at approximately 11 a.m. for about half an hour, and any and all are welcome. Please refer to the bulletin for re regular activities for the new month of August, uh, please remember that this Thursday evening there is no Bible study via Zoom. That's in recess again for this coming week. Next Saturday morning, our regular prayer meeting as usual, and then there will be the working bee around the church hall and grounds, commencing at approximately 8.30 a.m. Next Sunday services, God willing, will be as usual. Uh, in the morning, another of our retired pastors, Reverend Richard Vaughan, and in the evening we will have uh, John again. As previously advised, and following a short delay recently, three flights of timber stairs of the church, including these side stairs, will be maintenanced over these coming weeks. With reference to these stairs, they have been renewed, uh, and whilst the final painting is not complete, they are usable for today. We are now encouraged to engage in personal preparation prior to our call to worship. Thank you. Revelation chapter 5, verses 12 to 14. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessing and honour and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth for ever and ever. Let us pray. Almighty God, your word again brings us into your very throne room the mystery and majesty of your presence and that of the Lamb is set forth. 
Your word is full with references to the most glorious presence of our God, the full sight of which is beyond report. However, a description is set forth, made fit for the mind of men, and yet our understanding remains poor and impoverished. Lest we be tempted, hedge us about, that in our foolishness we do not offend you in the mind, pondering images that are idolatrous and blasphemous. Your word clearly instructs us that you are spirit, and they that would worship you must do so in spirit and in truth. Help us so to do in this morning hour, for the sake of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Our first song of praise this morning. Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. Praise him, angels in the height. join together in a time of prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we seek your face now to consider our ways in this past week. We dare to look back to acknowledge those matters that happened unto us and around us. We were confronted in recent days with the uncertainty of life, clearly demonstrated in that recent assassination attempt. One man's life was sought for death by a secondary cause and spared, but yet another, inconsequential to the slayer's intention, was taken. If in any way we fail to acknowledge your power and providence as the first cause, whether of the preserving of life or the taking of life, help us so to do. Lord, please forgive us if we have not meditated upon this solemn matter that it is appointed unto man once to die, then the judgment. Lest we have not sought you afresh in these past days, and sought to have concern and pray for those who do not yet know you. Lord, if we have complained in this past week of minor inconveniences, not accepting them as your providence, not submitting to them in obedience, and being unthankful, please forgive us. This is a distrust of your most perfect will. We do not know how you have guarded and protected us through our common comings and goings. Yet, even with those annoying delays and the fruitlessness of particular effort, we ought to be thankful. Where we are undergoing severe trials in our life, whether it be health, relationships, work or others, 
Help us to seek comfort from you, for your word promises that all things work together for good to them that love you. Grant us sufficient grace so as to persevere despite the hurt and disappointment and glorify your name. Where we have squandered our time in this past week in the pursuit of the wasteful, the foolish, the inconsequential, please forgive us and remind us in this coming week to act as the wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. If we have spoken a harsh word in response to an aggravation, forgive us and enable us to have the same spirit as our Saviour, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. Where we have failed to give an account of our faith, forgive us and grant us a new desire to show that fruit of faith. We confess these and that all our other many sins ever thankful for our High Priest, the Lord Jesus, who ever lives to intercede for us. Amen. Shall we now read the Scriptures? Firstly, uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 29 to 42. Verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptising with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptise with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptises with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God, Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated, teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Our second reading is from Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 to 10. Verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll, written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seals. And I looked, and behold, 
in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll to, and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. And to God be all the glory. Amen. Our next hymn is, uh, He leadeth me, he leadeth me, O blessed thought.
Brother James for leading the service. Um, I'm still not over the uh, asthma of these days. Just pray the Lord will give me a, a voice to preach. I, I love to preach, I love to teach, but sometimes there is a, an evil worker in this realm who endeavours to stop preachers preaching. I'd like to come to a prayer of intercession, but following the, uh, the prayer matters on the back side of the, the newsletter there, uh, praying for pro-life mission. There is an enormous battle happening in the world, and we can see it uh, happening in the American continent today uh, between presidential candidates, uh, one who says that a woman can do anything she likes with her own body, uh, keep life or terminate life or do whatever, and a, a man who says, and he may not be the greatest moral person in the world and people will bring him down, but he says that life's important. When I went to the Baptist Theological College, the first Theo College, I studied with Graham Preston uh, for a, a few years and he wanted to, with his wife, go on overseas mission. But they were greatly disappointed when that did not happen. So he took up this opportunity to promote the life of the pre-born child. And he has suffered great persecution, trials and abuse and hatred uh, since he began this work. But many of the pre-born children are alive today. It's a, a massive work and there seems to be a work of uh, the, the Lord's opposition to prevent children being born. Let us come to prayer. Lord, these things are so, so important. When we think of the unborn, yet to be born, <coughs> or pre-born, those who have been conceived, the greatest protector of that that human being is the mother. And we pray, Lord, for mothers who may find themselves in a situation where they're not uh, entirely happy with what happened. But they will sustain that life and keep that life as you have determined it until the day they breathe the atmosphere. In some ways, Lord, we we know in our hearts and minds that bringing children into the world and a, a miserable, evil world that it is, <coughs> seems to be uh, the wrong thing to do. But we follow your command. Because your command to Adam and Eve was to be, be fruitful <coughs> and multiply on the face of the earth. And we see today on this earth that there's somewhat over 8,000 million people, and some say that's enough, there's too many. The earth can't sustain this population. But Lord, this is your earth. This is your place of opportunity for every person to come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Saviour. As so many have said to me, they wish they were never born. Even Job seems to indicate these very things. But the opportunity of life is just so precious because, Lord Jesus, you as the eternal God <coughs> came and was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of Mary and you were born into this life and you kept peaceful and quiet for 30 years until you were called to preach and to declare yourself as the Son of God. And as the Holy Spirit descended upon you, not that you never had the Spirit, because this is your Spirit, but in the likeness of a dove, not actually a dove, but in the likeness 
so that men and women could see. And that Holy Spirit is with us today and quietly teaches and guides us and directs us as to what we should do and what we should believe. We are not to believe what the world tells us. We are not to believe what politicians say. As one candidate says, that a politician in time will go back to what they originally thought. Let us never go back to what we originally think. Let us go to the Word of God to think as God has willed. And for this we do pray for Graham and Liz and others involved in this kind of work, <clears throat> that they will encourage churches uh, to support the unborn, the pre-born, and the mother and families, sometimes in difficult situations. Because some of us lost our fathers when we were very young. Women have been made widows when they're quite young, with families to raise. And it's never easy. But you are there as the comforter to those widows and those families poor families and who have children and the church is here to help to teach the children. So Lord as our offering to you as we bring offerings here today <coughs> is that we may give our time an opportunity uh, to be able to teach the young so that by the time they get to university they have some sort of grounding in the fundamentals of scripture because modern universities can do tremendous damage to the thinking of young Christians. But we pray Lord that you may protect us and keep us all in the knowledge and safety of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. <clears throat> Let us, um, I'm talking about uh, Christ being the Lord of history because sometimes we think that man makes history. Man does not. Because Christ is the Lord, because that scroll that God the Father handed to Christ is, is representing that great plan of God's purpose in history. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But let us, <coughs> let us sing this next hymn, He Leadeth Me. No, sorry. Thou whose almighty word.
preached last week on Revelation 5, I'm just dropping back one or two verses uh, to look at uh, Revelation 5 verse 1 and 4 and 5. Let us pray first. Heavenly Father, please do guide us, not to our own understanding, but to your will <coughs> regarding the scripture. The scripture is difficult, maybe, when we first look at it, but this is your word and you have given us an understanding. Uh, Revelation is uh, a difficult book, as it should be, because the Lord Jesus, this is the revelation of yourself, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and we know very, very little, and we will not know more until we see you in glory. But until then we pray that we may not be afraid of the way the world is going, but realise you said this is how it will be. Not be afraid of the future either. So do guide us, we pray, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. In Revelation 5 verse 5 it says, sorry 5 1, it says, <clears throat> And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book or a scroll written within and on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And in verse 4 it shows that John wept bitterly. He just didn't have a tear. He was bitterly weeping. For none was found that could open the book. And the scripture says in verse 5, And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Now the Apostle John, he saw heaven. <coughs> it says earlier in the scripture that a door was opened in heaven. <coughs> and the risen Lord Jesus Christ called John to come up into heaven, for he would be shown the things that must be in the future, that must be. Now John saw the throne of God, and he saw the Father who sat on the throne and he saw a book or a scroll in the right hand of him that sat on the throne. It was a seal book. It had seven seals. Now this appears to be a book written with God's plan and purpose for the history of the human race. <clears throat> that book contains the history of the universe from the beginning till the end of time, including the special history of the redemption of mankind. It was sealed. But who could open the book? Because we want to see what's in it. John wanted to see. <clears throat> but no one could be found who was holy to open the book. <coughs> but one of the heavenly elders said, Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the book. Now this is one of the most glorious chapters in the Bible. Well, they're all glorious, but the, the revelation here is extremely helpful. And if any person who has any understanding of Christian truth and of the glory of God when they read this chapter 5, it'll call out the best in you. We are constantly singing hymns derived from this very chapter, chapter 5. Such as praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. We wouldn't know this about Christ, except we read this in the scripture. <coughs> and think about Handel's Messiah. And the Hallelujah Chorus. And the many choruses such as Thou art worthy, Thou art worthy, O Lord. Thou art worthy, O Lamb. There is something absolutely transcendent in glory, in the majesty, in the note of triumph in this chapter. <clears throat> in chapter 4, 
there is a picture of the throne room of heaven and what's happening around the throne of God. John was given that great vision of God on the throne. <clears throat> there were the, uh, the four living creatures, beautiful, holy, magnificent. There were the 24 elders joining together in that great song of creation, <coughs> ascribing a glory and majesty unto God, who is the creator, sustainer and ruler of all things. This encourages us to show that God is in control of all of history. But in particular we see something different in chapter 5. A sin entered into the history of earth, into this beautiful creation, and John begins weeping bitterly. It's the kind of weeping we have when we're first converted and we see the great holiness of God and the wretchedness of our souls. But his reason was a little different. There was no one in heaven or on earth or anywhere who was fit, who was proper to take that book out of the hand of God and unloose the seals. Uh, sin had entered in and there was a great problem. And John says, I wept much. In verse 4 of chapter 5, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look upon. There's a notice, note of, of sadness and pity and, and great unhappiness for all seems to be lost. <clears throat> but the encouragement is here in verse 5. That one of the elders said John, to John, do not weep. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. The whole scene changes. Now this is encouragement to the church. In our present day, the church is going through a terrible time <clears throat> of spiritual persecution. What we preach and what we say is being ignored by governments for the sake of the vote. But we can't change governments that much at all. But this scripture encourages us and comforts us <coughs> that though we go through trials and persecution, though we are disappointed and greatly discouraged this encourages us because chapter 5 helps suffering Christians. Because the Apostle John was given a glimpse of heaven and he saw the throne of God. And if we can see that glimpse by faith through scripture, we can understand why the angels are pouring forth their praises upon God. Now there are several important things here before I come to the, the crux of this. <clears throat> The first is that John has given a preview of history. That's the object of the book. The scene starts in heaven because it must start in heaven. Yet we are not meant to stay there simply gazing at that heavenly host. Remember when Christ ascended from the earth into heaven, there were two angels that said to the Galileans, Why do you stand looking up into heaven? because they had a work to do and it wasn't to be done by just gazing into heaven, into glory. We have to come down to the practical level. We will be there in time, but not yet, because God has given to us through the book of Revelation a preview of history. It's an account of the things that are <clears throat> certainly going to happen. Now there is no possible way that the will of Almighty God is not going to happen. There is nothing that can stop God from doing what he's going to do. I worked in the federal government a long time ago uh, protecting military installations from nuclear attack. 
it by various ways. And I was frightened. And many people were frightened. But you know, ever since Hiroshima and Nagasaki, there has been no nuclear weapon dropped on a city. There's been some accidents in, in Russia, <coughs> but it didn't happen because God is in control. Now it might happen, but it hasn't. So in, in the history that is given to us in the scripture, we see what's going to happen. The second general principle is that real history is not the history of nations. It's not the history of one nation trying to overtake another nation. The real history in the scripture is the history of redemption. And that's the message we have. That's the whole message of the Bible. That is the history that really matters. <coughs> it's the history of how God redeemed his church out of a corrupt and fallen world system. God made the world perfect and man was placed in paradise. But sin entered in and everything was spoiled. And what sin? It sins not the symptoms of sin that you see around us. Put very simply, sin was, is simply disobeying God's will. But God didn't turn his back on the world even though it had been ruined. <clears throat> Sometimes we get really tired of our own children. <coughs> they do the wrong things. We might want to sell them. But no one wants to buy them. We might want them, uh, we well, sometimes despair. But God didn't do that. Yes, there was despair in the heart of God. There was disappointment in the heart of God. Man yielded to sin, but God is not vindictive. He did not allow it to fester in iniquity until it came to nothing. We might say to someone who does the wrong thing, well, let suffer, stew in your own juice. But God, in his infinite mercy and love, from the foundation of the world, planned that the world which had gone wrong should be put right again through the Lord Jesus Christ, mentioned specifically in Genesis 3, 15 and 16. God initiated this great movement of redemption. Now that's the purpose of history. A continuing and growing purpose. And then there is an end to history. The purpose is something which is slowly but surely being worked out by God. His plan and purpose is to rid this present world of evil and sin. And to restore it. Not merely to its original pristine condition, but to make it even more wonderful and glorious, a new, renovated world, earth, inhabited by perfect men and women who are giving thanks and worshipping God and glorifying His holy name. Now that's the purpose. That's what the Bible's about. Nations come and go, but the kingdom of God is here. Now that purpose of God has met with much opposition. We see it in the Old Testament regarding Israel, how they disobeyed <clears throat> and God would judge them, bring a, <coughs> a redeemer. We see it in the New Testament. It has opposition and here it was given to John to see that there would be still more opposition. It is a picture of the attempt of evil to frustrate the purpose of God. But this is the great point. The purpose of God is going to succeed. Victory is certain. It's absolutely assured. And if someone works through his life and says, I will not believe in God, I will not believe in God, I will not believe in God, but at the very end, he repents. And God does that. Because God is extremely patient. God will triumph because the Lord Jesus Christ 
is the Lord of history, in your history, and my history. Now, as we see in Romans, the world without Christ is a world without hope and hopeless. Of all the people of earth who have done great things, when they come to the end of life, and if they do not have Christ Jesus, they are indeed the underprivileged of all mankind. God is seated on his throne and there is in his hand the scroll written on the inside and on the outside, rolled up, sealed with seals. <coughs> this is God's plan with the purpose of redeeming the world and delivering it out of the shackles and tyranny of evil and sin. But how is that to be done? A strong angel sounds forth a challenge. He proclaims with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? We ask, what can be done for mankind? How can this purpose of God to, to save any out of mankind be brought to pass? Because it was clear that no man in heaven or earth or under the earth was able to open the book. The point is that no man can save himself. No woman, no man is capable of saving themselves because mankind has failed. We know why we failed, because we inherited sin. But the point is that we often think ourselves better than other people. But look at the scripture, what the will of God says, no man can save himself. None. The Old Testament tells of men who are called by God one after the other. They are <coughs> wonderful men, godly men, and yet every one of them fails and falls into sin. King David in the Old Testament, a wonderful fellow, but he committed a few terrible crimes, and yet God saved him. Every one of them has an imperfection. Now good as they are, they're not good enough. Neither in heaven nor on earth is there any being capable of solving this problem. Mankind will never get rid of this world of sin and evil by himself. Still man harbours this illusion that by his own efforts, by his own endeavours, he can rid the world of evil and all its problems. I commend people for trying, but it's hopeless. They're trying, for example, to stop men bashing their wives, or wives annoying their husbands, or whatever. They, they try by legal means to do it. But it's impossible because mankind can never rid this world of sin. And that's where it all starts. It's sin and evil. And even the very best of men are like thorny briars. He cannot do this because God has said through his angel, there is no man able to open the book. <coughs> because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. And John was weeping bitterly. A try in your imagination, for example, to take Christ out of history. What do you have left? Uh, take the message of this book out of the future, and what do we have to look forward to? Well, people do it. They look forward to a time when there's no biological life left on earth, because it's heated up. They look forward to a time when the atmosphere is so full of poisonous gases that we can't survive and our teenage high school children are worried because they've taken Christ out of history. If we try to banish the Son of God out of our thoughts, what remains? Nothing. Hopelessness. He and he alone is the Lord of history. But there is one that comes forward, as it shows in verse 7 of <coughs> uh, Revelation 5. 
And he, that is Jesus Christ, came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And Jesus Christ is the one that has earned the right to redeem his people and he's taken this book out of the hand of the Father. The coming of Christ to earth and all that he did while he was here is the central point of all history. And Christ today, who is the centre of history, is unrolling history. The history of earth is briefly divided into BC and AD, before Christ and after Christ. He is the centre, he is the pivot. He is said by one of the elders to be the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is also described as the root of David. Here is the one about whom God spoke so long ago to Jacob. Back in those early days of history, the promise had been given. <coughs> the original promise about the seed of the woman that was to bruise the serpent's head, Genesis 3.16. Abraham was spoken to by God about this one that would come. God spoke to Isaac and to Jacob of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the one that was to come, the Messiah, the Deliverer, who would deliver the world from sin and evil and iniquity, the world of people. And the elder here says to John that here he is, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. <coughs> he is the fulfilment of that ancient prophecy because all ancient history leads up to him. There is another significant thing said here. John says, I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, the 24, stood a lamb as it had been slain. If the whole of the Old Testament history looks forward to him, the whole of our history looks back to him. And even when Christ is seen in heaven, he's seen in terms of the Lamb that was slain. There on the right hand of the throne, the throne of authority and power, is something that reminds us of his birth, yet still more of his death. Ancient history looks forward to him. That's what Abraham did, and that's what David did. And Malachi did look forward to him, but all subsequent history looks back to him, back to the Jesus of history, <clears throat> back to the Christ who died on the cross, back to the Christ who has made a sin offering for mankind, for you and for me. The coming of Christ to earth and all that he did while he was here on earth is the central point of history. Christ is the Lion and He is the Lamb. As the Lion, it speaks of His sovereignty, <coughs> His authority, His second coming in majesty and power and judgment, of His government and as King of His kingdom. As the Lamb, it refers to His first coming, His meekness. As the Lamb, He is Saviour. As the Lamb, he was judged. And as the Lamb, this speaks of the grace of God. In Revelation, he's referred to as the Lion once. But as the Lamb, he's referred to 28 times. The Lamb, who is identified as our Saviour and who is offering pardon for our sin. He is our mediator and high priest who intercedes to the Father on our behalf. The fact is that this very Son of God, who is God himself, he is deity, <clears throat> has walked this earth and as God has intervened in history. He is the biggest event that ever happened in the history of earth. <coughs> and the Lord has a program for history. He has a plan. His plan is not to gradually improve the world 
or to have a general influence on the world while we go about our business. In the end, there will be a change, but not at the present time. His plan is not to improve our ethics, although our ethics are improved, but that's not the main plan. His plan is not to produce a, a higher form of humanity. That's humanism, that's false idealism. It's not the teaching of the scripture. Christ's program, as we see here very clearly, is the formation of a new kingdom. Thou art worthy to take the book, the scripture says in 9 and 10 of chapter 5, and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, your blood, out of <coughs> every kindred, every language, every kind of people, every nation, every ethnic, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Here is the point at which the biblical view of life and history clashes with the thoughts and ideas of most people on the earth. The Lord is building a kingdom. He's adding people to it daily. God is coming into this world. God is coming down. It is Christ intervening, intervening in our lives. It is God in Christ returning finally. It is Christ forming a new kingdom and the kingdom is being formed within while we are living. He started <coughs> back at the dawn of history. God took hold of men and women. He chose them from tribes and nations. He marked men out for special purposes. He began to use particular people. He was drawing them out in the old days and he's drawing them out today. A new kingdom is being formed. It consists of men and women who have come from every kindred and tongue and people. And this kingdom of God crosses international boundaries. It's the ultimate kingdom of the world. <coughs> the kingdom of men who have been bought by the blood of Christ out of every tongue and nation and kindred and tribe. They will be gathered out and are being gathered out. And the day will come when he will have gathered the entire perfect number. God intended that this world of people would be perfect. Not everyone will be, but those in his kingdom shall be, and they are. And the Lord will not fire. Now perhaps some who are watching here today may think in their hearts, well, I don't believe in God. I, I, I don't believe God's in control. Well, take notice, if God's got his hand on you, you're going to find out very soon. Because God intervenes. He comes upon people and converts them and brings them into his kingdom. And they might be brought in struggling and crying and saying, I do not want to be restricted in God's kingdom. I want to do whatever I want to do. But God will take men and women to himself. He's gathering them in. He's calling them in. But finally the kingdom will be complete. And that's biblical history. <coughs> now people scoff at this as they scoffed at Noah. And they ridiculed Lot. And men laughed at the prophets. And even ministers today. Just as they even laughed at our blessed Lord himself. And yet the world that dismissed his talk about the resurrection was shocked by his resurrection. As certainly as the ancient prophecies have been fulfilled already, so the New Testament prophecies that we find, and especially in the book of Revelation, shall be fulfilled. And the only hope for the world is that Christ <coughs> is forming this perfect kingdom with a new and perfect humanity. 
And Christ alone is doing this. He is breaking the seals and opening the scrolls. He alone can do it because he is the lamb that has been, as it were, slaughtered. Remember the first problem in this world was the problem of the sin of mankind. That's the problem. That perfect world which is to be will be a world of people who desire to glorify God. We might struggle at first and then we find in our heart that we want to spend our time in, in communion with the Lord. Yet how can a sinful creature do that? And God cannot dwell with sinners. <clears throat> God cannot have communion with those who have sinned against him and who have sought to wound his eternal heart. It is a problem of sin and guilt and iniquity. How can that be dealt with? <coughs> the, the Bible answer is no man can deal with it. The angel said that no man can cleanse his soul and get rid of the stain of sin. The scripture says no man can erase the past. No angel in glory uh, can do it. And no dead saint can erase our sin. And even Mary, the mother of Jesus, cannot deal with our sin. There is only one who is able to do it. And that's what chapter 5 says, that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Lamb that was slain, he took on himself human nature, he became man who was born <coughs> in the likeness of sinful flesh, and who in a mysterious way took upon himself the sin of mankind and was dealt with on the cross by his Holy Father. <coughs> the scripture says, He hath made him, God has made Jesus Christ to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He saved us. First, because he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1.29. <coughs> Apart from that, he can do nothing, for my sin stands between me and God. Uh, John says, excuse me. <coughs> John says, I beheld a lamb as it had been slain. And my friends, he is the one we have to behold by faith. There he is in the book of Revelation, the one who has rescued us from the penalties of the law of God. He saved us from the guilt of sin. He has, as the lion of the tribe of Judah, met Satan in the days of his flesh and dismissed him with a word. He conquered him. The devil's defeated. He is a strong man, yes, an armed man, yes, but defeated. Christ has <coughs> conquered sin and death in the grave. He defeated them all. There is no power in heaven or earth or hell that can in any way stand up to and face Jesus Christ. He has defeated them. He has triumphed over them all. He calls us out. He keeps us. He holds us, he strengthens us. In the book of Revelation, the powers of evil are progressively destroyed. The beast, the false prophet, and finally Satan himself, the ultimate source, is taken and thrown into the lake of eternal destruction. Every evil power will finally be destroyed by the lion of the tribe of Judah. Christ is the perfect Saviour and in his mighty hands the program is safe. Is it safe? It is safe. Christ will bring to a consummation and a fruition the fact that he has saved you by the grace of God and by the work that he did at the cross and by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
The one question for you and me is this. Are we in that new kingdom? Let us all repent and entrust ourselves to this same Jesus Christ and believe him as our Saviour. <coughs> the Lord, a, a difficult sermon in some ways to preach because it goes against everything the world is telling us. The world of people out there says that we can be good people, we can do the best we can, and I'm glad they try, and that uh, finally, when we die, we'll go to heaven. Because God will let us in, because he's all of love. But no, the Bible says a bit different. God is love, but he's also a judge. And that judgment's been handed to Jesus Christ, the Son. And the question will be, when we arrive, is have we believed in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as our Saviour and Lord? Have we turned away from the things of this world and the love of it, to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, strength and spirit? And thank you, Lord, you take us as we are, because you've dealt with our sin and our guilt and our grief at the cross. And John saw you in heaven, in the future, as the Lamb that had been slain, who has redeemed us unto God. Thank you for this, and we pray that redemption will apply to everyone here today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Now let us, uh, I will let you, I don't think I'll be singing much at the moment, uh, sing this wonderful hymn, and I'd love to hear you singing. Praise him, praise him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer.
Just forgive me, I won't greet you at the door today. I'll ask my brother James to give you the royal handshake. Um, but if you'd like to talk about any of these biblical things in the hall, I'll be there. Let us uh, come to the Lord. We pray, our God, that the peace of God which passeth all understanding may keep our hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, <coughs> Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst us and remain with us always. Amen.